All right. Um, does this hearing sound okay? Great. My name is Andrew Bissell. I was a math and economics major here at the university. Graduated in 05 and stuck around for an extra year to do my math degree. And when I was given the topic for this talk, failure question mark, my first instinct was to go to something about bouncing back. I've had what I would call sort of maybe four major flame outs in my life. One was as an undergrad here, and the, the three others are in my time, my professional career since I graduated. Um, and that was my first thought. But when I thought about it a little more, I felt like, I think, you know, you look at like these business books that are coming out now with titles like Down is Up and, and Fail Win and How to Get Rich by Going Bankrupt. And I feel like failure is almost sort of being fetishized and, and trivialized um, by this. And I wanted to talk a little bit about going through a professional failure, what it was really like, and to maybe take away, not so much to try and take away some of the trivialization of it, not to try and make you be afraid of failure, but just to have a bit of a healthy desire to avoid it. Um, so I worked as a uh, trader from 2009 through 2013. Um, in that time, I first started out having joined a firm that was run mostly by old style Chicago floor traders who were kind of trying to make the transition into computerized trading. And my first year there, 2009, I mostly just went to the office and listened to my boss shout obscenities at Nikkei brokers all day. The second year, they got me into just beginning to write computerized trading code. And I worked on that through 2010, didn't really get anywhere. And then in 2011, I finally really hit on something. And my code went gangbusters and made my company a whole bunch of money. And they didn't pay me a bonus because they had made a bunch of bad bets on their old Chicago floor trader friends who couldn't make money anymore. And, and I wound up not getting paid. So that was sort of, aside from my undergrad failure, that was sort of, I feel like my second failure was staying with that company as long as I did and sort of wasting a lot of time and effort there. But it was necessary to sort of learn what I wanted to do, which was the sort of high-frequency trading stuff. So I was talking to someone else I'd been working with at that company. We decided we were going to leave and try to do our own thing. And we were making the preparations to do that in the end of 2010, beginning of 2011. And I'd been chatting with him while I was at work um, and went to use the bathroom and had left my chat window open. And came back into the office, and my boss is standing right at my computer looking at the chat window, and he sees me come in and goes and sits down at his desk, which was just sort of down off to my left. And I sat down and could tell that something had completely changed in the room, and was already so upset and infuriated at my circumstances that I just sent him my resignation letter that, that night while he was sitting there. And he turns to me and he goes, you sent me a resignation letter while you're sitting right next to me? And I said, yeah, and had it out with him. And, and, you know, I had kind of known for a while that working for these people wasn't really going to work out for me, and we, we had a very um, acrimonious split. So I went off to do my own thing, and we raised some money from uh, independent investors, uh, went to the Chicago Board of Trade building, to their offices there, and convinced them to give us um, a bit of money to trade with. I was working in Korean Kospi 200 options. And we essentially rewrote our entire trading strategy, which we had had at the previous company from scratch. Um, I made a lot of improvements to it. I know that it was better than what I had had in the market before because my old company kept my trading code in and was competing with me. And our brokers told me when they gave up and couldn't make money with it anymore, and I was still making a bit of money. But what happened was I'd been working like a dog for four or five months to get this thing out there. I get it in the market, and it was making pretty good money, and so I kind of got a bit complacent and quit sort of looking for the next edge in the trade. And in high-frequency trading, your edge is always kind of decaying and going away over time, and you have to be always improving. And I just quit improving the trade. Well, uh, our investors were getting more and more skittish. They wanted us to be doing better. And I finally, just before they pulled the plug, I found this little quirk in the market that I think if I had found it, just a little bit earlier and implemented it, could have made uh, a ton of money. But I will never know because they wound up pulling their funding from us and asked us to stop. And um, you know, I've moved on, I've done well, I have a great life now. If someone came to me today and gave me a chance to go back and find that quirk two months earlier and do it, 
uh, I wouldn't take the chance because I love what I have now. I have a beautiful 13-month-old baby daughter. Um, I love my family and wouldn't want to take that chance. But I still have a folder full of all the old trading records that sits at the top of my Google Drive. And every time I go to it for some other purpose, I see that and I kind of um, uh, feel a bit of just self um, approbation that I didn't really do that. And so that's, I think, in terms of failure, it's not going to financially destroy you. You won't be debilitated. But if you haven't kind of, when you have that chance and you haven't given it quite everything that you could have, that's the part that will eat at you, is that maybe you could have done a little bit more. And that's what, even though you shouldn't be afraid of failure, you should have a good, healthy desire to avoid that. That's, that's it. Thank you.